uh, ICU cases right. uh, are dead. So you, that's not a big number. But imagine though, in the US having, I think they had a record 60,000 cases in a day. Um, yeah. You know, it's, it's a lot, right? I mean, it's, 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 and then we have countries that say, you know, we're over it, it's done. And they don't understand that it, this COVID is not done, unfortunately, because so many other countries are experiencing it and haven't peaked yet. So how can we feel we're over this until everyone's over it? That's the challenge. Yeah, and we are rounded by Chile and Brazil. Who yes, who oh, are, yeah. Who are, yeah. So we are afraid of, of that also, yeah. Absolutely. But we are in under lockdown for more than 140 days. So Amazing, wow. We, yeah. Wow. Wow. We can't stand it anymore. It's There's going to be, there, there will be many papers and many um, insights from this in the years to come about the impact of what even just locking people down for months does, right? Just to the psychology and the economy and all the other yeah, things sure. and all the other secondary uh, bad things that happen as a consequence of us trying to, you know, save people from COVID we're causing many other problems. That's the, going to be the, sure. the balance. Yeah. For example, the kids at school, Right. I have three kids and yeah. they don't want to do anything. Yeah. You start quarreling every day, but yeah, it's a, uh, it's a lost battle. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Well, as I told you, this is a relaxed atmosphere. Uh, you published yesterday in your Instagram that you were coming. So some surgeons called me uh, to ask me to stay here. <laughs> so I, I opened the door. For example, here is uh, our colleague that I told you, Dr. Miguel Ayerza, who is the president of the Argentinian Association of Orthopedics and Traumatology. Surprising. And as I told you, I worked with him as um, secretary general of the association. Um, Dr. Miguel Cabanella told me that he, was, he wanted to stay here. So maybe he can visit us. He, he comes almost every Friday to hear and to, and to discuss these conferences. Superb. So we are happy if we have him also. Um, and we have two more minutes and we will start with your conference. I will present you, sure. of course. Sure. Uh, we are very grateful of the podcast to you, you, you gave us, uh, to Pablo and, and me. Yes. And I have to confess that I was just going out from the operating room. I didn't know what uh, what was a com uh, at that postcard, uh, podcast <laughs> going to be. Uh, I thought we were going to ask your secretary so she can ask you the questions we had. So oh, uh, no, we are very no, no. grateful that you, you have that time for us and, no, and you lovely. Would, no, I'm, I'm recorded that post podcast and, and you and you publish it on Northo Evidence that it's a great um, platform for, for learning and 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 well we we use it very much also for our journal clubs and it's, it's very useful for us. Good morning Super. Pablo. Pablo you know Pablo I work do. with us we are we are five surgeons uh, in our team and and well, we are ready to start. It's 10 o'clock. So I'm going to present to you. I'm going to, gonna, I'm sorry. I have to share my, my screen. Good morning, Dr. Cabanella. How are you? I'm good. And you? Nice to have you here. Thank you very much for coming. Mike. Hey, Miguelete. How are you? Good. Gerardo, ¿me habilitas para compartir? Listo. Thank you. Well, oh no, this is not the presentation. <coughs> Can you see now? Well, good morning, everybody. We have started our, our HIP webinar on Fridays. We have the great visit of Professor Mohit Bandari. He is the academic head of the Division of Orthopedics at McMaster University. Uh, we are very grateful to have him here. 
He's also the president, uh, brand new president of the Canadian Orthopedic Association. And if I want to present him, well, I could say all the morning things about all his, um, the things he'd done in his career, but he studied at the University of Toronto. He also uh, works at McMaster University. He made a trauma fellowship in University of Minnesota, also training in pelvic and acetabular surgery in California. He uh, is also a doctor of science from the Gothenburg University in Sweden, and also made some postdoctoral studies on clinical trial designs and execution. He has a Master of Clinical Epidemi Epidemiology and Biostatistics at McMaster. And he made uh, many uh, leadership programs and has a lot of awards, for example, the Order of Ontario, and most recently, the Canada's highest honor, that is the Order of Canada, because of his uh, scientific um, works. Uh, he has also the Canadian Orthopedic Association's Award of Merit, McMaster Dis Distinguished Alumni Award, uh, and many others award for outstanding achievement, like the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons Medal, the Edward Sampson Award, the Kappa Delta Award. He is among the top 10 most cited orthopedic fracture surgeons in the world. He has more than 1,000 papers, and he collected over $55 million in research funding over his career. So, Professor Bandari, thank you very much for coming, and we would are very interesting uh, in, in hearing your conference. Thanks a lot. Wonderful, thank you so much, Martin. Let me just, if I could, um, just share my screen. Um, and once doing so, I, I'll just get your approval to make sure everyone is able to see this. Uh, and once yes. I get the thumbs up, yep, everyone can hear me. At yeah. any time, if you can't, just send me a note or a, a chat box will pop up so I know that I've lost you or I've lost uh, communication. But let me begin, if I could, um, by just, you know, being extremely, extremely grateful for the opportunity to talk to you. And in a time right now that I suspect all of you feel this, you know, everyone's doing the big, very big webinars. And I think that's a wonderful opportunity, but big webinars never replace what we're doing right now. A small group of us having a chance to face-to-face -face virtually interact and have a discussion. So what I thought I would do is I would share with you some slides um, and the title I have here is Thinking Bigger, and Thinking Big just isn't big enough anymore. So we have to say, what's the next thing we do? Especially in a crisis and how things were going to change, it might be useful for us to examine that. I've been thinking a lot about this. And let me just walk you through in my own, what happened to me. And reflect, if, I, if you could, on what happened to you 18 weeks ago. 18 weeks ago, I was here with some friends. I was in Chihuahua, Mexico visiting a colleague who was a McMaster University alumni. He was launching a book on meniscal transplant, and he had asked me to come visit so they could launch. This was February 20th of 2020, and I was enjoying a wonderful interaction with these are some of the residents and some of the fellows. At the same time, right around that time, there were 75,000 cases worldwide, 2,000 deaths across 70, 27 countries with respect to COVID. I had no idea, meaningfully, how my life was going to change. And I think for many of us, we didn't have that idea. We didn't know. And then here we are, less than 10 weeks ago, we are in this situation where I'm talking to my colleagues. And even as of yesterday, I have friends who give me this type of quote. You know, I'm not sure what the future holds right now. And I'm working to distract myself from overthinking the longer term consequences of this pandemic on my life and work. Do any of you feel like this, where you're staring into a fog, and when people say, well, what do you think is going to happen next week, or next month, or next year, and you say, I can't see further than today. I can't even see what's going to happen until this fog lifts. And I think for many of us, we've been caught up in doing so much that we've never taken time to have what I would call a productive break, a time to really think, because if you sit down remove all of the distractions and ask yourself to be in your own thoughts. That's very, very, very hard to do. To me, this is the quote. This is the quote I think that has uh, impacted me the most 
um, in the last four months. If we want to have greater impact faster, we have to slow down enough to reflect on what we've done and what we're going to do. And this led to really a discussion with Martin about, you know, what could I speak to this, you know, very, very important group about? And I thought I could share with you a little bit about my own 25 years in the pursuit of evidence-based practice, clinical trials, but actually move further away to say, if we're going to actually think bigger, we all have to figure out creative ways to ask questions that are really, truly meaningful, and then develop the collaboratives to allow us to answer them. So let me begin with a quote, a quote that I think for me has great, great meaning. And I think this is the crux of how we are going to be able to think bigger. And I think it's because we become more creative when we're inventing, if we're experimenting, if we're growing, we're taking risks, we are making some mistakes, but ultimately we have to find this passion in what we're going to be doing. In 1990, I had the, uh, I guess, privilege of being at an institution uh, that coined the term evidence-based medicine. It, it was coined back then as an attitude of enlightened skepticism. And in 2000, we had our first book come out called Evidence-Based Orthopedics. At that time, many of my colleagues had said, you know, there is no evidence in your field. These were my medical colleagues. They said, you know, you're not going to find it. It's going to be a very small book. And they would jokingly say that. But as it turned out, we had lots of evidence in orthopedics. And we really, really uh, were excited about what we we're doing. We we're, about, we we're about to launch the second book, which hopefully will come out this year. Um, it's, you know, it's a very large book, which is a good thing. That means that we do have information. And we're excited to be able to share this uh, with you. And I'll make sure I do that. But this is what it gets back to. You need time, um, however we do it. We need time to take a step back. And ultimately, what we have to be able to do is use data, right? This is all about using data, you know, because anytime there's a situation that's uncertain, and we've seen it right now, um, we are always going to have the fear as leaders of taking the wrong steps. Why? Because we delay action. We say, oh, it's, it's, it's not going to affect us. We delay and downplay the threat until it becomes clear, but by the time the threat actually becomes clear, we are so behind that we're trying now to control the crisis. I suspect you've seen this happen time and time again, and more so than any other time in history, we've seen it happening around the world. Take a look at what's been happening with respect to COVID. So why do we need to think bigger? Well, look at what happened in that short period of time. There were 1,741 articles published across 59 countries in 447 unique journals. This was a paper that we published in the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery around April, uh, right around the, the, the peak of the pandemic uh, push. And this was an information epidemic. So let me just describe to you what we're seeing here. This is basically from early end of January, where my cursor is, all the way through on the x-axis up to early April. If you look at the total number of uh, red and blue stacked lines, these are the total number of publications that we were seeing and the increase in publications that we were seeing related to COVID-19. There were 1,741 COVID papers published over nine weeks in the first you know, push of that pandemic surge. Journals were publishing anything and everything, and mostly they were publishing commentaries and expert opinions. You can see all the blue stack bars versus actual data studies that were the red stack bars. And when we looked at the highest impact journals, the New England Journals of Medicine, the Lancets, the, the JAMAs, all these you know, high impact medical journals, they were actually proportionally publishing many more commentaries and expert opinions than they were primary data. Now we can argue what that looks like um, and what that means, but the point of the matter is no journal was immune to the information epidemic. And then I suspect some of you may be aware that, you know, early in uh, June here in 2020, two elite medical journals retracted papers over data integrity. Now you can argue that that's a real problem. It's a real problem uh, in, in the fact that when you push information out so quickly that there's going to be problems. And in fact, two very high profile papers and two very, very reputable journals had to have retractions of major papers because of data integrity issues. That is a real problem. So how do we make sense of this? Right now, there are over 600 randomized clinical trials evaluating treatments for COVID. 
I call this the second wave. If we're talking about waves of information, the second wave is the wave of information that starts very slowly and peaks late. Why? Because to do a clinical trial, it takes time to get patients. It takes time to evaluate data. And by the time you have data, it's much further, further along. So what's the first wave? Well, the first wave is where we have all kinds of opinions and we have, sorry, all kinds of opinions and ideas that are often, as you see the section B here, are often where we have lots of misinformation. Anything above this red dotted line is what I would call lower quality information. And there's a big chunk of that in the first wave. So when we're trying to understand data and information, we have to be a little bit more patient to get the good data or we have to find out who has the trustworthy opinions. And we can discuss that at, at a later time. But this is just an example of what we were trying to do at that time. We were trying to, in my own personal life, was saying, how do I find trustworthy information? I talked to my colleagues. And you know, at the opening, you heard uh, uh, our having a discussion with, with Martin saying you know, that we had a podcast with him because we were looking for our colleagues to give us real insights about what was happening at their institutions so we could use that information until we had data-driven information that we can ultimately also add. All we're doing is looking for signal. What does thinking bigger mean? It means look for signal, but signal is often clouded by noise. Think of all the things that create noise in you trying to understand a particular problem. But for me, many, many years ago, I decided that the ruler of the evidence jungle was the randomized clinical trial. Take it or leave, but that was my perception. And in the evidence-based medicine paradigm, it made a lot of sense. So I started to work with teams and tried to say, well, let's tell stories with data. And if we tell stories with data, we can say, okay, we can start with opinion. And we saw lots of that during COVID, but we can move all the way up to the top of that hierarchy, which is the randomized clinical trial. And in doing so, that allowed us to have impact because the biggest challenge we find in our field, and I think orthopedics has done a great job of it, but we don't always do a good job of telling our own story. So how many times have you had a situation where a third party government association or a political association or insurance company or some other group says they have set a guideline, a guideline that impacts the care of the orthopedic patient? but the orthopedic surgeons weren't the individuals involved in developing that guideline. So if you don't tell and you don't collect your own evidence, uh, you can't own your story. And my argument has been, let's work together globally. Let's collect data that's important to us. Let's ask questions that are important to us and let us tell the story of orthopedics so nobody else will. And we started this and we're, you know, I guess my, my journey is far from over, but I look back to my very first study and you don't see it here on the, very left called the sprint trial. It was a tibial reamed, unreamed nailing trial that had a thousand patients back in 1998. And remember back in 1998, the average size of the studies back then were 50 patients, maybe a hundred patients. So it was a bit of an undertaking to do something that was going to be 10 times larger, but it was one of the most important studies we ever did. Why? Because we determined that we could have surgeons working together in multiple countries towards a common goal. And that led us all the way through to programs now that are uh, well over 10,000 patients. And I hope that the next study will involve many of you as colleagues as we think of even bigger and better ideas. But at the end of the day, these are the types of, of uh, results that you can have when you start asking questions that are simpler and have a greater, broader impact. And we can discuss that. But at the end of the day, I never started my career thinking that we would end up in this situation. I started my career thinking, I just like to do and answer questions, and I love to work with people. And at the end of the day, my hope was, and I think this is really what I believe EBM is about to me, making better decisions. However we do it, we want to make better decisions. If I asked you this, to you on a personal level, what's more important, your decision-making or your ability uh, as a surgeon? Now, if I said to you, um, I need you to pick one thing that will make you go from good to great or great to exceptional. What would you pick? Think about what it, think about for a second, what would you pick as a, as a choice? Now, if you are someone who's early in training, you might say, you know what, right now, the most important thing for me is I have to get good at the craft of surgery. So skill is important. But once you have passed that learning curve of a skill, 
you're competent, you're careful. In fact, you, you're an excellent surgeon. What's going to drive you to the next level? And the truth of the matter is, in almost in every field, sound decision making is the absolute essential core to the highest standards of patient safety. I mean, that's basically where we end up. And ask yourself this, when has a poor decision executed by the most expert of surgeons ever resulted in a good outcome? Can't happen, right? The most expert of all surgeons in the world cannot have good outcomes if he or she consistently makes poor decisions. So at any level, we have to get better at how we make decisions. And where does decisions come from? That's element of intuition, element of experience, but data. And that is why well, we, we should never assume that experts alone are going to be the key. In fact, in the entrepreneurial world, experts are, looking, experts are somewhat looked down upon, right? They say they don't invent the future because they are caught in the past. They're, they're looking at my last cases. This is what I did before, but they're not looking always to the future. But here, Here's where I think the power of experts come. Use your surgical expertise and find ways to get good signal. Wherever you find that signal, wherever you get that data, if you've ever seen an expert using information that he or she has either created themselves or is aware of, they are a very powerful and intuitive individual because they're able to make those shifts. Now, it takes time. We've heard about the time, right? The 10,000 hour rule, the 10 year rule. Actually, new estimates say you need 25,000 hours to become an expert in any one area. Now, imagine yourself in orthopedics already knowing how, many, how much you have to do. But then say to yourself, okay, now I also want to be a good, good at collecting data or good at evaluating data. We must start very early and we must make it a consistent daily habit. So how do you do that? So for me on a personal level, this is why I, this is the only reason that I, I moved to something that was ortho evidence, which is this tool. And again, I'm not here to talk about ortho evidence loudly, but just to give you the concept of how do we keep up with information? It's impossible, my friends, right now for any of you to read the 50 or 60 or 70 orthopedic journals that are out there that have orthopedic content every month. It's hard enough to get through one journal. And maybe you don't need all of that. Maybe what you need is what I need which is a filter that says, find me the best stuff every month and make sure that it's available to me in a very easy summary format. And here's the point. We did our own research internally and we found out that any single journal misses over 90% of the best evidence every month. So why would anyone who wants to stay on top of the best available evidence read just a single journal? It doesn't make sense. It may have made sense 30, 40, 50 years ago when there were only a few major journals in which the majority of the best quality content was being put. But now we see with the explosion of new uh, ideas and new journals and new opportunities and new places where great orthopedic literature is being published, we have to go wider. But here's the point. The risk of small studies is really, really big. And let me tell you the fundamental core. This is a great paper by um, a professor of, of uh, epidemiology at Stanford University, and he writes a very provocative hypothesis why most published research findings are false. And you ask yourself, wow, what does he mean by that? If you have not seen um, this work, I urge you to take a look at this. But he makes a point of saying that when we have a hot topic phenomena, we've just seen it in COVID, when we have small studies, they can't be reproduced, and then we have problems. And we just saw retractions happening in the last few weeks in top journals. So he has absolutely uh, been on the correct side of this. So if we go back to 19, sorry, if we go back to my early study, the, 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 the tibial fracture study, reamed versus non ream nailing, we had 50 patients at one point enrolled. And, it, and our suggestion was that un ream nails, if you look here with the boxes, that's the, that's the result, suggested they were better than the reamed but we had a very large confidence interval. And all that meant was, is the truth could be anywhere from there to there. But we didn't know what it was. What we'd normally do in a study like this and say, you know what, it's a small study, but if we had more patients, we would be able to find more precision. And therefore, we would be able to prove then that our trend favoring the unreal male is actually a true finding. But that's not what happened. We actually recruited more patients. When we recruited more patients and got well above a thousand patients, we actually found the, the opposite finding, that the ream nail was significantly better than the unream nail. But if we had stopped the study at only a few hundred patients, look at what our result may have been. We would have been concluding possibly 
the opposite finding, or at a minimum that there was no difference. But the truth of the matter is, it was a difference, and we didn't find that difference until we had more patients. Did the same thing with soaps and open fractures. So we had done a pilot study of 100 patients in which we had found that if you put soap in the wound to irrigate an open fracture wound initially, there were gonna be fewer complications. Well, look at this. When we did the larger study of 2,500 patients, soap actually, actually uh, did not um, help at all. It was actually harmful. So when we looked at reoperations, reoperations were actually higher in soap and lower in saline. So we were actually promoting possibly a situation where soap would have been in error promoted, where it actually uh, resulted in more adverse events than the control. And this led to a, a statement by a colleague of mine at McMaster who said, you know, there's a concept we call fragility. And let me give you the example of this. This was a study you may be aware of um, many, many years ago in 2002. Now it seems like it's 18 years ago. There was a real push to look at, you know, BMPs or, or basically biologics in the treatment of open fractures. And there was a study that actually did this and published and had lots and lots of uh, media around it. And they said, listen, if you put in BMP into an open fracture wound at the time of irrigation, the first visit in that first period of time, you can reduce the risk of having a reoperation by 60%. Everyone loved this. They said, wow, this is huge, big, 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 big information for fracture care. But then if you actually look at it, you say, okay, well, there were 12 patients who had a reoperation in the BMP group and 29 patients who had a reoperation. When you do the statistical analysis, it's peak 0.02, and we all know that if it's less than 0.05, it's probably a difference that is meaningful, so therefore, it should be accepted. But the fragility hypothesis for my colleagues says, no, no, don't look at the p-value. Look at the total number of outcome events. And here, there are only 41 outcome events. And then he said, do a simple experiment in your head. Let's say that is the study finding. Let's say you repeat that study. Let's say we repeat that study in Argentina. And you as a group of colleagues say, okay, we'll repeat it. And you get this finding. You say, well, you know what? It still looks like the BMP works because we only had 15 uh, reoperations in, in the one group and we had 26 in the other. It still looks like it's less. Therefore, we've confirmed the findings. But if you just have three outcomes go from one side to another, this study would no longer be significant. And the point was, is that when you have very few outcome events, even a few outcome events flipping from one side to another can render the p-value very, very fragile. And this was actually shown. So in fact, in March of 2011, that study was repeated for the most part. Look at what happened this time. They had the same number of outcome events, 44, but this time there was no overwhelming success of BMP. In fact, there was no difference. And in fact, after that, its interest you know, waned and no one really talks about BMP2 in the treatment of open fractures. That was a classic example of a very good trial, very good trial, probably a bit small, but when repeated, had a fragile p-value. Not, it is a very, very, very common issue in other areas. So if we look at what's happening in surgery, this is the top highest impact journal in surgery. They look at, you know, um, a diverticular bleeding. For whatever the topic area, look at what they've done. They said in 27 patients, versus 27 patients treated with, with a control and a treatment, they had a 66% reduction in the risk of bleeding with this new treatment. Now, ask yourself this. They only had 15 total bleeds in that study. If this study was repeated, how many events would have to go from the treatment side to the control side or the control side to the treatment side to render this a non-significant finding? If you quickly said, oh, I think it's one, you're absolutely right. A single outcome event or bleed, if this is repeated going from one side to the other, would render this study completely negative. That is the problem and the challenge of very small studies with few outcome events. So not only do we have to think bigger, we have to think big enough that we have enough outcome events that a few of them flipping over if we were to repeat the study wouldn't render the findings completely false. And this gets back to my colleague, Dr. Devereaux, who has been promoting this at McMaster University. And he says, you know, it takes a globe. We have to work together now. There's no excuse for us not working together to do research. These are photographs, friends, that I've taken from in the past when I traveled through hotel windows looking out. Anyone recognize the cityscape? 
If you're looking hard, you may notice that the bottom is actually Osaka, Japan, and the top is just a picture of Los Angeles, California. How about this one? Right, New York and Delhi, but people say, oh, we can't work together. We're too different. Our cities are similar. The people's dreams and hopes are similar. And research that matters should be significant for everybody. It should allow us to be more global than less. It should allow us to have more people engaged in research than we're not engaged before. And shouldn't at, at, our, at an absolute goal of ours as a group to say, how do we contribute to the well-being of all people? Now, I use these check marks when I'm thinking about my next study. Do I, do I ever achieve these? It's very, very hard. But I do my best to say, I'm trying at, at my goal. My vision is to have studies that at least attempt to answer this. And friends, here's the point. The hardest part of research, when you talk to award-winning, uh, you know, in Edward Witten, uh, for all intents and purposes, probably, probably the leading, leading intellectual particle physicists and um, on string and M theory in the world. And he, he he's, a, he's a he's a brilliant thinker. And he said that you need a question big enough worth answering, but here's the point, but little enough that we can actually answer it. So let's take big problems and break them down into specific components that we can, with our abilities and our team and our networks, actually answer them. So what do we need? We need more countries. We need more centers. We need more of us. And if we have more of us, we'll have more patients. I mean, that basically is simple. And we have to get away, I think, if we want the big global studies, from more complex issues to simpler ones. They have to solve fundamental problems. So for example, robotic surgery, while very innovative and very important, is not going to be one that can be translated to all parts of the world. So that's an innovation that isn't gonna be necessarily guided by large, simple trials. It's gonna to have to be other questions like the management of hip fractures in which we're able to recruit you know, thousands of patients worldwide. And you can see here from India to the United States, they all contributed. Right, And that's what we're trying to do. Maybe timely, access to timely care. This paper was published recently, most recently in the Lancet, but this was the pilot study. 93 sites, 25 countries. That's the kind of question that you could say in any part of the world, we don't care how you treat the hip fracture. We want you to treat it with best practices and best principles that are that, that on, based on the available um, implants and technologies you have. But here's what we want. We want you to get that patient to the operating room faster. And we want to randomize patients to rapid care versus standard of care. That question and that answer is relevant in any part of the world at any point. So what about open fractures? Yes, there's all kinds of bone morphogenetic proteins and biologics, but what about the fundamentals of just a good thorough irrigation and testing? We did that. And I think that is the reason that these very simple ideas can lead to much more engagement worldwide. And here we are now having recruited about our 36,000th patient. We just, by the way, friends, have just gotten an NIH grant to recruit the last 5,000 in Latin America of all places. So the final four or 5,000 patients will come from Latin America. Um, and this is a simple study that's observational study following patients going forward with a, a motor vehicle accident and 30 day outcomes. And we're looking specifically to understand what are the factors associated with early complications in this patient population with the target of saying, we will identify those and the ones we can modify, we will create a series of randomized clinical trials worldwide. So um, it's been a fascinating experience to do this. But here's the point. All of us say, well, you know, we all want to think big and we want to think bigger and we have all kinds of good intentions. And many people will come to you when you say, I want to do this next study whether it's an association, whether it's your colleagues, whether it's a mentor, whether it's a student working with you, they'll say, you can't do it. It's impossible. Can't be done. How many times have you heard in your career, ah, oh, this can't be done. It's, it's, it's not possible. But usually when someone says it can't be done and they're telling you, you can't do it, it's because they have looked back and said, well, you know, I tried this. I couldn't do it. And how do you respond to that person? My, my choice was to say the following. Absolutely, sir you and I, you know, uh, sorry, absolutely, sir. I understand that I can't do it alone, but you know who can do it? We can do it. And through a series of a hundred interpersonal conversations with one individual, 
you can go from one person to two to four to eight, and it just multiplies. And before long, you have a group of people working together to answer big questions. And I've always learned that great people are in good or great institutions. Institutions don't make great people. Great people make great institutions. So you stay loyal to individuals. And wherever that individual may end up going, you stay loyal to those people. Um, and I think when you have that model, you realize that it's the people you're engaging in, right? So we often say to ourselves, well, should we focus on the institution as our target? And I always say, focus on the individual. Find the right people anywhere in the world. So great research can happen at the biggest of institutions or the smallest of towns. It's highly dependent on the individual and the motivation of that individual. And great leaders, no matter where they are, no matter what level they are, anticipate change. They have a very diverse network of people around them. And they have the courage to say, you know what? I actually think that I've been doing this this way for many years, but I'm not sure it's the right way. And I want to test a, a different way. And if a different way is better, I'm willing to change my practice. If we have that mentality, we can actually make big change. This is a group of people at our orthopedic division day. You might recognize Professor Tom Einhorn from Boston University, and you might also recognize the current editor of the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery, Mark Swinkowski, sitting right immediately to my left there. And you also see um, Professor Robin Richards, who was past president of the um, Canadian Orthopedic Association, and they were reminiscing. And this is what um, Thomas Einhorn wrote. To me, success is better defined in terms of making a positive impact on the lives of others and achieving happiness and fulfillment in one's own life. Mark Swinkowski wrote, while with two solid decades of collaboration across multiple centers, the orthopedic community has led the international effort to improve the quality of evidence on which we base decisions. But friends, Nobel Prize laureates will tell us nothing is easy. And people who win awards like this say, most of it's through failure and through grit and through continually pushing forward. And if you're going to ask big questions, you have to be prepared to fail. That's what the Nobel laureates tell us. And I would tell you that no matter what we do when we start something, there are going to be a series of what we call near fatal failures in every trial. It's how we come across in these crises that will make us and allow us to think bigger. This is the actual recruitment chart of that hip fracture trial you saw published in The Lancet. The actual recruitment was significantly less than what we had anticipated, and we were running out of funding, and we had taken lots of funding. So what happens in a situation like this? Well, some people say, let's just give the money back. It's a futile trial, it's over. But what happened actually was people came together. They said, we're gonna solve this. This problem is an important one, and we're gonna go back and we're gonna be creative about how we resolve these issues. And ultimately, we did that. We recruited over, over 1,000 patients, and we hope that we are able to make an important uh, contribution. But when I look back at that trial and many other trials, we've had many, many root causes of failing. Ask yourself this, how many times have you been involved in a program that just gets more and more complicated and harder and harder to do because we are fearful of saying, well, we'll miss something. We should add this. We should add that question. We should add that question. Before long, it's 10,000 questions, and then it's like not possible to get done. We must go back to fundamentals, keep our studies simple, get rapid recruitment and get a lot of people around the world who have expertise to help us recruit, recruit as fast as we possibly can. Let's make sure that we have enough infrastructure at the beginning of the study to actually pull it off. And finally, let's tell everybody that we are going to do this and let's tell everybody that, yes, it's gonna be hard and there are not gonna be days where you're gonna feel good about this, but we're gonna push through it and ultimately have a sense of grit and conviction. And if we do that, we can move forward. So when I think of my last thought uh, before we hit to a discussion is, I always think back at other areas that have had great success. And you know, we often look to the business world to say, you know, how do these great business entities grow and, and to create so much value? And when you look at the leadership in those areas, and I know I'm speaking to many, many leaders right now today, you know, when you asked like Jack Welsh, who was you know, considered to be the CEO of the century, he said, you know, it wasn't me. It was my job was to develop talent, was to work with really, really smart people and diverse people and give them the freedom to be creative and to, and to succeed. And I think when we do that, that gives us all kinds of exciting opportunities. But here's the point. You can't teach someone to love research. 
You can't teach someone to have the ability to energize other people about research, and you certainly can't make someone become passionate about something they're not passionate. Maybe they can learn to be good at that, enjoy something, but if you want to find those people, they almost will come to you. They will almost come to you because they will prioritize some of these things over anything else they would do. And that's the type of people that we have to, at least at every institution and as leaders find, help them um, support them so they can help us grow areas where we want to uh, engage and go forward. I'll leave you with the last few slides here. Which one of this to you immediately strikes you as this is the Picasso? And if you're like me, when I look at all these different pictures, I look to the one at the very end and say, oh, of course, that's the Picasso. But friends, each and every one of these paintings was Picasso as he evaluated and went through his life. So when those of you who are a bit more senior say, you know, I'm leaving the research and this innovation for the next generation. We're going to recruit the young, the young energetic candidate who's going to become our research person or who's going to help us grow this one area. Picasso didn't become Picasso until the latter part of his career. So whether you're thinking about your career, ask yourself that there is opportunity at every day and every opportunity to grow. So no matter what you think, you have time to, to become whatever would be the greater version of who you are in terms of how you want to live your academic life. So I always say to both young men and women who are aspiring, who are maybe going through a period thinking, I'm not sure this is what I want. I say, just keep pushing through. This is maybe what you need to do before you find exactly where you're supposed to be. And then people would go, and this is a very classic statement. Of, uh, there's a story of, a, uh, of, of, a, of, of an individual who walked up to Picasso at a restaurant and said, would you do something for me? And Picasso did something in 30 seconds. They said, this is beautiful. How did you do this? He goes, no, 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 no. It's, it's not how quickly I did this. It's taken me 40 years to have the insight to know that these five brush strokes are the essence of everything else that has to get done. And I think that when we think about research, when we think about our careers in orthopedics, maybe for many of us, the, the longer we're in it, we are having to, rather than make things more complicated, we break it down to a couple of key brush strokes. And maybe thinking bigger and being more creative is limiting things and finding exactly what it takes to do something beautifully and elegantly. And that, man, my friends, may be really the true value of all the time and energy that we put into it. So for me personally, this is what I try to do at a personal level. If you want to grow as an individual and as an academic, I think you've got to be creative. You've got to be thinking about the things that make you passionate. You have to invest in things that give you joy to the extent that you can. You have to continually push yourself right to the brink of failure and try to have successes along the way and embrace that. And no matter how old you get, no matter what part of your life you're in, ask yourself, can I reinvent myself? And if you can do those and live with this very, very simple pledge uh, that seems a lot, but actually is quite simple, I think we can absolutely think bigger. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mo. It was a great, fascinating, inspiring conference. And we are on a holiday today. Yesterday was our oh. independence day. So it's a great conference for, for a holiday. Super. So, well, thank you. No, thank you so much. I think there are some questions. I will start um, asking you, how do you level the quality of science if you engage underdeveloped countries, because that may be a problem. Yeah, you see, and I think that has been some of the narrative that has, you know, and I showed you those photographs where you say, you know, people, like, I think if we got down to the fundamental questions, the fundamental questions often have very um, simple answers. I mean, simple tactics. The more complex we make a study, I think the more people we exclude in helping us answer that. And I think, uh, also that there is, and I'll, and I'll say it someone from someone who's learned from my own mistakes, there's an arrogance sometimes that you have when you're working in a certain institution in a, or in a popular city or in a particular country to think that the questions that matter to me should be the questions that matter to everybody. And when you actually inter in interact with colleagues around the world who are thoughtful and deep thinkers, they often will tell you, those questions may matter to you, but they're not the big questions that we're facing in our field. And you may think you've answered those questions, but they're not answers around the world. So to get to your point specifically, I think the minute you start to truly listen, 
rather than talk and get insights, you realize very quickly that there are certain tiers of types of problems. There are complex problems that will take many, many years to solve. And then there are simpler things we can do as a global community to just move the needle a little bit. Those types of questions I think are perfect for global collaboration. And quite frankly, getting countries around the world, the more um, countries you get, the better. And I think the number one factor is the engagement of the principal. So if the individual from that country is motivated and keen and willing to collaborate and willing to, to have integrity and honesty, as we all should be, all of us, um, we have had more than success in working with those types of individuals. And so I always say, you know, it's a mindset and not everyone has that mindset, but when you find that person or that group, um, it's infectious and great, great things can happen. And I know that, I mean, I don't have to speak to this group. Uh, I, I know many of you work internationally as part of your cause. Um, and maybe you feel sometimes that you're not in, engaged in the same way or you're not allowing to be engaged. I say you have more data than most other parts of the world and you show the world that. And you show the world that by working together and being meticulous about the way you collect your data. Good, thank you. Is there any question? I would, I would like to hear Dr. Muscolos or Dr. Miguel Acherza's questions or, or thoughts. That would be very, very inspiring also. Buen día, Miguel. Buen okay. día, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Mohit Bandari. It was a very interesting uh, presentation. Very, very nice, very good. Um, I was very impressed about your definition, definition of a leader that should be anticipated. It, had to, it has to be uh, that diversity and a lot of courage. Um, how can you expand those qualities? How, how do you uh, train people yeah. to have those uh, leaders' skills, you know? Yeah, that's a great point. And, you know, some people say, you know, uh, they're, well, l let me start off by saying that education and leadership, Miguel, as you probably know, is a $50 billion business around the world. I mean, there are many, many business schools who are trying to teach the next generation of people how to be leaders. Then there's that question of are leaders born or can they be created? Um, and there's probably a mix of everything in that. Um, what I feel is like yourself, leaders like yourself would uh, model it. So the hardest thing I found when I was, uh, you know, you could say growing up, you know, you're a junior and you're looking to other mentors, you watch them very keenly and you model them. And if you see exceptional leadership modeled, they don't have to tell you that they're doing this. You just see it. It becomes part of you. For example, if you see a leader who openly it introduces you to people all over the world, you begin to believe hmm, it's normal for me to interact with lead, uh, individuals all over the world. And it should become my culture to get new ideas from people all over the world. That doesn't always happen, as you know, but that would be one. The biggest thing I think that um, a leader can tell someone who he or she is trying to mentor is model to them it's okay to fail, demonstrate when something has happened and show them how quickly that is a positive. We have a generation, I think, of younger individuals at all levels who are afraid to fail. And maybe the society has made it such that you know, we, we, we must always win and failure is a bad thing. And we've not demonstrated risk as an opportunity to learn. We always hear about it in books, but no one ever models it. So in short, Miguel, I would say, you know, I've learned the most from watching people model. Uh, and when they model it, it's great. If someone intellectually shows you slides, like I've done, and says, okay, good, everyone do it, and I never do any of the things I've ever said I, you know, I'm talking about, it becomes almost non-authentic. So good leaders will just do what they normally do uh, and move it forward. But I do think you have to introduce people at an early stage um, to these kinds of concepts. It's very powerful, and I've been there. Like, I'll give you an example. Dr. Michael McKee, uh, whom you may, some of you may know, um, you know he's you know, a respected, uh, he was a respected surgeon in Canada, now he's in Phoenix, Arizona. But when he was talking about clavicle fractures, he openly said, you know, I, for many, many years, believed that non-operative treatment was the only treatment. I may, have, right, I may have been wrong. It's very powerful when you hear someone that you respect say, I may have been wrong, and I'm willing to change my mind 
but I will collect correctly the data to do that, and then I will decide. But that sort of is a that's a powerful, powerful moment. So showing that you know what I thought before can be changed. I'm going to introduce you to lots of different people, and I'm going to have lots and lots of interactions um, like that. I think are very powerful. I think I've I've probably said a lot here, but I hopefully that's kind of what you know uh, the responses that you're, you were looking for. <laughs> Thank you, Mohit. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Miguel. Mohit, another question. Uh, how would you do good science in a country who has not fundings? We don't have fundings in Argentina. Yeah, how yeah. So that's, that a, no, no, that, that, that's a great point. So, you know, we have through our, like, like I'll show you, like our, our program is very much where we will go looking for funding. So this is why I always say, right? Great research doesn't, if uh, you can't be in a silo, we should be working together. So one thing that, let's say our group, I'll use an example of us. Our group is, it can put together a project with another group and say, let us try to find the funding. And when we find the funding, we will allocate aspects of that funding to Argentina so Argentina can be successfully able you know, to, to do what needs to be done. If we all believe that the findings that we're asking are globally relevant, right? The problem happens is if you do a study in Argentina that in fact only has implications for your population, then other countries would say, well, even if they have a result, it won't apply to us. So that's why there's power in big collaborations because we've done this before, which is we find a larger sum of resource from other grants like Canada will fund big programs and allow us to send money away. We just demonstrated at the National Institute of Health that the National Institute of Health, the US-based funding, will fund Latin America. They have exactly done that. So we can find other sources. Uh, but again, it's working together as a team because a strength of one part of your team might have a strength in money. The other part of the team's real thing is we have a strength in patience and numbers, and we're going to get them. And together, we're going to be successful. Thank you. Any questions? I have my last question. Um, I, I was very surprised uh, when you define an expert that extrapolate to the past. Yes, uh, yes. Yeah, I was very impressed with that sentence. And uh, you, you might write, you know, because the expert uh, is, has the experience of his past uh, uh, experience. Yes. Uh, how, and how can you turn on your, your mind and uh, watch the future. I mean, yes, uh, right, right. Yeah. It's hard. Right. And so, I mean, and that's the point Like, how many times have, 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 have any of us had this happen? And I've had this happen many times. I would go to a surgeon and I'm going back now 20 years when I was a trainee and I would go to one of my consultants and I'd say, Dr. X, you know, why don't you do that procedure? Cause I've read about this procedure. He goes, Oh, I had a patient had a horrible infection. I stopped doing it. It was, yeah. It was the experience was I did something that happened to me and therefore I no longer accept that because I have had a problem with it. Or why do you do that when everybody else does another procedure, Dr. X? Because in my hands, I've never had a complication. So everything I think Miguel is extrapolating from whatever has happened to me. And the challenge with that approach is that's the case series, right? The powerful, powerful case series, which is in my series of cases, this is what's happened. The truth of though is that what if there was a situation, a revolution, the I am nail was a revolution, right? You could argue locked plating was a revolution. It would be unfortunate if someone didn't advance, you know, science in a way that allowed us to move forward. But where do you think these revolutions have happened? Usually, in my mind, it goes back to the same points of, of leadership. If you as a leader associate yourself with people that are a little bit different than you, you're likely to have breakthroughs. So probably the engineers, the economists, the business leaders, the surgeons, the trainees, you know, someone, the patient, all that group of people together, when they're interacting, those ideas are going back and forth. And I think through that, you're able to at least have uh, what we call a, an integrated network that allows you to be better a thinker than, um, than not. I think if you never get exposed to new ideas, it's very hard to extrapolate. I think that is the entrepreneurial mindset, Miguel. I, I don't know, but I think that is probably what is happening and why if we just rely on our own instinct, we may be right. And sometimes you've seen that. Great, great leaders just have it. But the majority of us, I think, would probably not 
be able to advance unless we have a diverse network and surround ourselves with people. I suspect you do that, so you know, but there are many who don't, right? There are many who never, never, never leave their small group. And so they never see the world through someone else's lens. And okay. therefore, it's hard to think of the future, I think. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Mohit, do you have any thoughts about why we are seeing eight times complication rates with hip fractures than compared to before COVID? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's an interesting, it's, well, I mean, COVID is complex for many reasons, and I don't ever espouse to be an expert um, in COVID, but I can tell you that, we, we all know this, right? It has is, it is disproportionately affected the vulnerable. And if the vulnerable are considered the elderly, the vulnerable are considered those in low middle income countries, uh, if the low, uh, if the vulnerable is considered those who are part of minority uh, groups, they have been disproportionately affected. Um, you know, and you can argue for you know, for a host of reasons. But with respect to hip fractures, let's take a step back. If you look at advances, look at all the research in hip fractures that has happened over the last fifty years. Right? There was um, James Dixon in nineteen fifty ish or so at the uh, American Orthopedic Association said that we have to we have to find ways, innovative ways to manage hip fractures. And if we continue to focus on just replacement, we're, we're, we're going to get lost in this and we're not going to make big advances. And, you know, you can argue that for 50 years, if you look at mortality, even before COVID, mortality, we haven't really made a big difference in, you know, uh, surgery A versus surgery B for improving mortality. We may have made some improvements on who gets what treatment and how do we improve function short-term or long-term, but even if you look at longer-term-ish, everything kind of evens out. And that led to one of my colleagues who was a non-surgeon, and this gets back to Miguel's point, right, is how do you figure out new ways? And we just had a recent ortho evidence um, world tour series where we had a, a hip fracture surgeons um, in uh, Sweden. And they were saying, you know, we've spent our whole life looking at hip fractures. And we have come to believe that maybe we're not looking at the whole patient. Maybe orthopedic surgeons have to also think about the post-operative care and the pre-operative care as being really critical to managing outcomes. And what we're seeing now in COVID, COVID isn't affecting surgery. It's affecting the overall health state of the patient. You know, someone who might have, you know, an uh, issue with, um, respiratory issues is just having, you know, more, you know, more difficult problems. Someone already had a, a, a potential to clot, you know, they're clotting more. Um, so we're seeing that the health issues are overriding any advantage of rapid surgery or any advantage of the type of surgery. And I think that that's the kind of movement we have to think about. And maybe hip fracture care, uh, and maybe you're already doing this as you think through this issue, needs to become very, very integrated and much more interdisciplinary as we think about the type of research we're gonna do. Surgeons deciding on research questions alone may not be the right approach going forward. And maybe what we should be doing is getting many, many other stakeholders involved and deciding on what are the key questions and focus areas that we wanna do. And then you could design those types of studies. Good, thank you. Problem. Uh, do you have a more or less 10 minutes to, to hear? <laughs> my some slides for the young people or you have to leave oh me no no i'm i'm more than happy to i have i have easily more time yeah yeah i have 10 minutes for sure okay. i have the full hour yeah okay um i will finish this presentation and share my screen um, Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Yeah. Well, I translated the slides, but as the message, I would like to give the message to the young residents who are here. I would speak in Spanish, if you don't mind. No problem, uh, no, no, no problem. Are translated into Perfect. English, so I, I think you, you, may, you, you may understand. Great, thank you. Um, 
Lo que les quiero hablar un poco es hacer un poquito de hincapié en lo que Mojit nos, nos, nos transmitió, y que es la importancia de, de la investigación en ortopedia. Pero tengo un conflicto de interés, porque les voy a hablar de mi experiencia personal inicial, después de pensar 26 años, de, después de pensar 26 años que la investigación es, es importante. Eh, yo me recibí en el año 93, no fui un gran estudiante porque tuve un promedio más o menos estándar, pero sí sabía bien inglés a pesar de no haber ido a un colegio inglés, pero tomaba clases antes o después del colegio. Eh, en el año 94 hice el internado rotatorio de la facultad y mi padre trabajaba con el doctor Schechter y le preguntó qué me convenía hacer en ese año, si me convenía a rotar a algún lado, y el doctor Schechter eh, recomendó que me vaya un, un mes al Rush Presbyterian de Chicago a hacer ortopedia oncológica, cosa que me pareció rarísimo, pero bueno, yo llegué ahí con Steve Gitelis, que Miguel lo conoce mucho, y enseguida me enchufaron un case report para hacer, ¿no? y era un case report bastante raro, yo no, no sabía más que eh, ortopedia haber tenido un mes, un mes y medio en la rotación de, de la facultad, pero era un caso interesante porque era una metástasis en el hueso trapecio de la mano, como presentación de, una, de, una, de, una, de, un, de un cáncer, ¿no? Lo escribí, ahí como ustedes pueden ver, con una máquina Olivetti, y nunca vio la luz, pero eso me encendió el fuego como para empezar a entender la importancia de la investigación. En el año 95 entré en el hospital, con esa cara rara que ustedes pueden ver ahí, y durante la residencia no tuve una gran producción académica, algunos reportes de casos, algún trabajo de coautoría, pero en el medio del medio, con lo cual ustedes pueden ver que no fui muy trascendente, pero sí, y no lo digo porque esté acá Miguel, cuando roté por el Cineot, me eh, dieron la oportunidad de involucrarme, porque ustedes lo han escuchado muchas veces, que no solo hay que mostrar y entrenar, sino que hay que involucrar a la gente, me involucraron para que haga una colecta de datos de pacientes con hemipelectomía interna. Y tuve la gran oportunidad de no solo recolectar los datos, sino de poder escribirlo, de que el doctor Músculo y el doctor Ayersa me enseñen a hacer un trabajo científico. Y eso se publicó en la revista Argentina. Y eso, de esa pequeña llamarada que había tenido en Chicago, se transformó realmente en una fogata muy importante. En el momento que Mojit estaba investigando fresado y no fresado en Canadá y en el mundo, yo era jefe de residentes. Eh, en el, el trabajo de ese año para el concurso de residentes era fracturas de los huesos largos, y yo tuve una discusión con uno de los médicos de planta que trabajaba en un grupo, y me prohibió utilizar los casos de su archivo, con lo cual yo me quedé sin tema, pero empecé a pensar y me di cuenta que en el hospital teníamos un bioterio y que sumado a la, eh, al tema de, de residentes de ese año, podíamos hacer algo experimental. Y creamos un modelo animal viendo si el clavo fresado eh, tenía la misma incidencia de embolia pulmonar, en riñón, en ojo, en cerebro y en intestino que el clavo no fresado. Y no solo nos fue bien, sino que ganamos el premio de residentes, ganamos el premio de la Academia Nacional de Medicina, como ustedes pueden ver ahí, y fue un trabajo hecho enteramente por residentes de ortopedia y de anatomía patológica, y fue publicado en el año 2002 en el Journal of Orthopedic Trauma, que fue el primer trabajo enteramente hecho por residentes publicado en la historia del servicio. En el año 2003, el doctor, eh, durante la jefatura del doctor Músculo, me nombraron eh, médico de staff, y a los 15 días había una reunión de, de médicos de planta y el doctor Músculo me dijo, tenés que preparar una conferencia que hable del desarrollo personal y en equipo del traumatólogo. Bueno, me puse a buscar como loco y me di cuenta que el traumatólogo en ese momento, al principio del, 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 del siglo XXI, eh, no investigaba. Y esto venía de muchos años atrás, como por ejemplo de esta charla que había dado Bradford, que era el presidente de la American Orthopedic Association, y que la definición del traumatólogo en el siglo, fines del siglo XIX era el hombre que se ocupaba de las vendas y el custodio de esa, de esa habitación del horror que se llamaba Instituto de Ortopedia. 
y me di cuenta que el cirujano ortopédico en ese momento no podía separar la parte laboral de la parte pensante. Y eso creo que es algo que tenemos que luchar todo, eh, todos los días hasta el día de hoy. Obviamente la medicina asistencial es muy importante, hace que el paciente tenga la prioridad, también nos inculca principios morales y éticos profesionales y nos satisface la conciencia del, del que realmente tiene una vocación médica. Y es cierto que si no hay pacientes no hay medicina, pero la investigación implica o involucra el desarrollo, nos da una base sólida para que nos crean tanto de manera profesional como académica y también a, eh, evita que nos convertamos en, en técnicos eh, y también nos permite desarrollar nuevas modalidades de tratamiento. Y hay que aprovechar porque en unos años la inteligencia artificial va a aprender a hacer eh, investigación y en eso vamos a quedar atrás. Como les decía, la investigación es desarrollo, la investigación de hoy es la tecnología de mañana y las publicaciones son la manera más rápida de que nos conozcan no solo en Argentina, sino en todo el mundo. Así que, bueno, con Miguel, con todo el equipo nuestro y muchos de los que están acá escuchando, pensamos que la investigación no tiene que ser algo aislado, sino que tiene que ser eh, parte de nuestra actividad asistencial diaria. Y no sirve empezar a los 40 años. Esto hay que empezar a hacerlo, si se puede, durante la carrera médica y si no, a los 25 años. Por eso pensamos que un residente debería estar todo el tiempo eh, involucrado en por lo menos un proyecto científico. La rueda de la investigación, ustedes la conocen, implica una excelente base de datos, como tiene el CINEOT, como tenemos nosotros y muchos otros equipos en nuestro servicio, eso implica observar, protocolizar, controlar los detalles, y eso nos va a llevar a optimizar el tipo de medicina que hacemos. Uno de los principales requerimientos para la investigación es el conocimiento del método científico y eso debería ser parte de la educación de todos los residentes porque eso nos permite romper la derecha a estatutos rígidos de autoridades históricas, de tradiciones, y a que nos preguntemos ideas aceptadas y terapias para intentar buscar nuevos conocimientos a través del desarrollo. Requiere obviamente en la investigación como dijo Mohit, de creatividad y de curiosidad, pero que eso es propio para cualquier eh, carrera exploradora. Y todos tenemos algún potencial de creatividad. Como decía Ambrosio Paré, que inventó la ligadura vascular en vez de la cauterización con un fierro caliente en el, en, en el siglo XVI, cualquier, cualquiera de nosotros tiene alguna capacidad de creatividad. Y cualquier es un genio, como decía Einstein, pero si nosotros jugamos un pescado como para ser un eh, montañista, obviamente ese pescado se va a sentir bastante estúpido. Entonces tenemos que encontrar la capacidad creativa de cada uno y eso es más un rol de los mentores que de, eh, de, que, que de los creativos. Queremos, yo creo que es esencial la administración del tiempo y uno no tiene que ser Jonas de Dark eh, con la valija de la máquina del tiempo, sino que hay que tratar de poner un stop administrar bien el tiempo, tratar de no estar todo el tiempo pensando en diferentes pacientes, porque eso, eso mata, aniquila el tiempo para la asociación libre. Y como dijo Freud, es la falta de conciencia sin censura. Eso, eh, si uno está todo el tiempo pensando en diferentes pacientes, como sería cuando uno hace una demanda espontánea, eso aniquila la capacidad creativa. Los requisitos de la creatividad son la observación, la sensibilidad, la persistencia sobre todo, la intensa concentración, la tolerancia a la ambigüedad, ver las cosas de diferente manera y al pensamiento divergente. Todos tenemos desarrollado el pensamiento convergente que es el que está atrás de los ojos y es el que hace encontrar una respuesta rápida ante un problema porque ya nosotros lo conocemos. Pero es mucho más importante tener pensamiento divergente, que no es creatividad no es un sinónimo, pero es esencial para tener una capacidad creativa y es encontrar diferentes maneras de interpretar una, una, una pregunta o diferentes respuestas a una misma pregunta. Eso es el pensamiento divergente. Obviamente es muy importante la lectura, el pensamiento analítico y para eso sirven los journal clubs y leer 
todo lo que uno pueda, porque eso estimula la creatividad, ayuda a hacer una escritura clara, como decía Quintilian, 500 años antes de Cristo, es aquella escritura que es incapaz de ser mal interpretada. Y eso hay que hacerlo en el día a día, entrenar con el WhatsApp, tratar de escribir bien, que nos entiendan, sin falta de ortografía, somos médicos, qué horrible que uno escriba mal, ya sea en un WhatsApp, en un mail y mucho más en un trabajo científico. La lectura es el entrenamiento y como decía De Vicenzo, eh, que tengo razón, pero cuanto más entreno, eh, tengo suerte, pero cuanto más entreno, más suerte tengo. Y sepan ustedes que poder hacer investigación en Argentina y en el hospital es realmente una bendición. Tenemos mentores, tenemos soporte financiero, tenemos ten asistencia técnica, tenemos datos, que eso es esencial. Y eso les recomiendo que lo hagan porque es una experiencia muy positiva y muy productiva. La felicidad que trae un email del Journal of Bone o de cualquier otra eh, revista del exterior cuando uno eh, tiene un trabajo aceptado es muy difícil de medir. Pero tengan en cuenta, como decía eh, Mojit, que es muy dependiente de lo que uno, tra de lo que uno transpire en la camiseta. Miren lo que le pasó al premio Nobel de Medicina, Peter Radcliffe, que en el 2019 le dieron el premio por las reacciones genéticas de las células a la hipoxia. La revista Nature le bochó ese trabajo en el año 2012 diciéndole que no, eh, no, 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 no permitía eh, dar eh, mayor información a los científicos de la que existía. Y esto es algo que... Eh, muchas generaciones nuevas piensan es que la, la vaca da leche, la vaca no da leche. La vaca, para que dé leche, uno se tiene que levantar a las 4 de la mañana, ponerse las botas de goma, caminar entre los obstáculos derivados del intestino de la vaca, atarle la cola, atarle las piernas, y ahí recién sacar la leche con una maniobra específica, porque si no, la leche no sale pero sepan que publicar un, un, un eh, artículo de primer autor, conociendo de manera obsesiva a todos los pacientes de una serie, cada párrafo, cada limitación, cada sugerencia del revisor que uno la cambió, es uno de los momentos más recompensantes en la carrera médica. Tengan en cuenta que si uno tiene una excelencia médica, como ustedes pueden ver en el hospital, y a eso le suma, la robustez científica creo que es la mejor manera de hacer medicina, así que se los recomiendo, empiecen este fin de semana que es largo, encuentren un mentor y no pierdan más tiempo. Muchas gracias. Good morning, Dr. Nicolas Piusi from Cleveland Clinic. How are you? Doing very well. Nice to meet you all this morning. Well, Mo, it's been a great pleasure to have you. We know you are a very busy uh, man, so uh, if you just want some thoughts to close this session, uh, I will be, be, be very I, Great. I just I just heard the, the the last part of it. I'm just in between cases, but I think it, it's just what you just said. Is there's no secret formula. Um, nobody born was born knowing. It's just a matter of waking up early and working hard and having perseverance. I was just yesterday looking at my journal of arthroplasty submission website, and and I found that out of the last ten articles I submitted there, I got eight rejections. And it's just a, it's just a way of <laughs> Keep, keep working at it. People usually just see the success. They see the tip of the iceberg and they say, oh, you're publishing a lot. But well, well I'm trying even many more times. So just... Anyway, you're doing a lot. Mohit, <laughs> any, any final thought, thoughts, Professor Bandari? Yeah, you know, I, I would say the same. You know, when people look at your success, um, they have to look deeper to see what's underneath that tip of the iceberg, you know, and, and everything else is under there, right? It's the hours you've spent awake. It's the number of people you've talked to. It's the number of revisions. Um, and I can tell you, there's nothing sweeter than the very first time you work through your first paper and you get it published. 
publish. So for me, people say, what do you remember? I remember my very first paper and I remember my very last paper. Everything in between is a blur, <laughs> you know? So, you know, I- Because you have a thousand. That's because I have a few, have I have a few, I have a few. I yeah, yeah, yeah. every paper. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I'm always terrified to be in a debate now because they're gonna use my own papers against me. I know it, so uh, you have to be careful. But that being said, but that being said, um, on a serious note, your uh, lecture beautifully, beautifully uh, encapsulated sort of the key issues that we all face, right? And there is no magic to doing research, um, but there is great magic when you find research that you feel compelled to do um, and you feel it's in your heart and you will keep pushing. Like Nicholas just said, you know, he's not going to stop because of eight rejections because he's passionate about something. He's found a problem. So I hope we can all uh, make this the beginning of a much bigger discussion. Um, and I hope that we will be seeing each other much more frequently as we think about the launching some new programs together, because I think it's we're stronger together and doing bigger programs than we are doing small. So my own version personally is to do big, big programs going forward and to uh, engage really, really intelligent, thoughtful people like yourself as we go through. But thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Mohit. Thanks a lot for coming with us. And I wish you a great tennis and biking afternoon. <laughs> so Wonderful, much. everyone. Take care, everybody. Great weekend. Bye. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Gracias, Miguel. Bye bye. Gracias, Nico. Un placer. Llegué justo al final, pero ahí al menos puedo conectar un minuto. Me alegro. Un abrazo para todos. Buen fin de. Igualmente. Que tengan un buen fin de semana. Chao. Saludos. Chao. Chao. Gracias. Saludos. Gracias.